You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Yes, so that's Janet Thompson. Would you like me to spell it? If you wouldn't mind, thank you. Just the surname, please. No problem. It's T H O M P S O N. Great. Now, Janet, before we go through the openings I have here in front of me, might I just take a few more details to complete your profile on my system? Of course. What would you like to know? Well, let's start with your email address, please. Okay, Jan Thompson at hort dot net. I see. Is that Jan as in J A N? No, that wasn't available. I had to make do with J A double N. Here, let me spell it for you again, just to be sure. J A double N T H O M P S O N at hort dot net. Much obliged. And could I ask, do you have your referee details to hand? Yes. What do you need? I need one work reference and one character reference from a friend or colleague. Okay, for a work reference, there's Jane Foot. She's my former boss at Bermuda Girls School, head of English. Okay. My personal referee is Monica Carbody. Mon and I have been best friends since we met in Bermuda in 1991, when she was deputy head of English under Mrs. Foot. Perfect. And you mentioned, of course, that you're an English teacher. But are there any additional subjects you're qualified to teach? Yes, I have a diploma in special needs, and I can also do history to GCSE level. Very good. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Do you think I stand a good chance of finding something? Oh, better than good. In fact, we have some positions we can offer you today. You see, it's not so difficult to find a temporary role. Tell you the truth, there are plenty of them around, but getting a permanent position will prove a little more trying, though. Would you be prepared to take up a position short term? Of course, anything that pays. Excellent. Well, there are three positions that I can offer you right now. The first is a teacher of English in LaSalle School. I'm sure you know it, right in the city centre. Yes, near where I live, actually. Even better. Well, it's a six-month contract, and the very attractive thing about this role is that the head of English at LaSalle will, if she's satisfied with your performance after six months, offer to make you a permanent member of staff. Wow, that's food for thought. It certainly is, bearing in mind what I said before about how hard it is to find a permanent role. The second position I have to offer you is in a school near Chelsea. It's called the Chelsea Free School. Are you familiar? I can't say that I've heard of it. Well, this contract is for one year, which is a lot better, looking at it from a short-term job security perspective, than the first role I mentioned. But you also have to realise that you are a temporary replacement for a female teacher who has taken maternity leave. There is no prospect of the position being made permanent. I see. I have one other vacancy at the minute, though I doubt you'll find it quite so appealing. It's situated in rural Cambridgeshire. I'll spell that just in case you want to take it down: C A M B R I D G E S H I R E. And the school simply goes by the name Cambridge, though it's not in any way related to the other more well-known establishment of the same name. I was just going to ask that. What a lovely location, though, eh? Yes, but there's a catch. It's only a six-week contract to cover for someone on extended sick leave. I see. Well, I guess that's ruled out then. What sort of sort of salary can I? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture about trumpets. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. The trumpet is quite a remarkable instrument. Take the B flat type, for instance, the kind of trumpet most people use today. If we stretched one out in a straight line, it would measure nearly one hundred and forty centimeters in length. What we see in the diagram then is a very long brass tube wrapped around itself in order to save space. To produce its characteristic sound, the musician blows continuously into the small metal cup on the left, called the mouthpiece, which is shaped to fit the lips. The air travels along the lead pipe and round the tuning slide, which can be moved in or out to change the instrument's pitch. The air then reaches the feature that distinguishes the trumpet from, for instance, a bugle: the three valves that extend from above the top to below the bottom of the instrument. Each valve can send the airflow one of two ways: either along the main pipe, the shortest route, or else into an extra length of tube, thus lowering the pitch of the sound being played. The musician does this by pressing one of the finger buttons at the top, diverting the air into the first tube if the first is pressed, into the second and shortest by using the second, or into the longest one, the third, by pressing number three. The air then continues its way round the bend in the lead pipe and along to the end at the widest part of the body, known as the bell, which projects the powerful sound forwards. Incidentally, all this breath forced through the metal of the instrument does, of course, contain water vapor, and this will start to condense and form droplets after a certain amount of playing. The result is a gurgling sound from the trumpet. So, to avoid this, there is a device on the tuning slide called the water key, which, when pressed, lets the water drip out. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. The trumpet, in one form or another, has been around for a long time. The earliest type we have actual proof of was a short, straight instrument used with marching soldiers by the ancient Egyptians, eighteenth dynasty, which makes it three thousand five hundred years old. Although other cultures in China and Peru certainly had something similar very early on, this use of the trumpet in military contexts, as well as at ceremonial occasions, was to continue through the times of the ancient Greeks and Romans. But it wasn't until the 17th century that it became a genuinely popular instrument, at least in the West. At the beginning of the 18th century, it was finally accepted as part of the typical orchestra, and the addition of valves in the 19th century, making it much more versatile, consolidated its position as a major orchestral instrument. Nowadays, the sound of the trumpet, which is of course both loud and clear, means that for many pieces it is used to lead the brass section of the orchestra. This sound and its versatility have helped extend its use to other forms of music, such as jazz and pop. But there is another very practical reason for its widespread popularity. In comparison with many others, such as the tuba, the cello, or even the trombone, it is a fairly small instrument that can easily be transported and played just about anywhere. The downside of all this popularity, though, is that as everyone wants to be a trumpeter, it can be difficult for the young musician looking for work to find a vacancy.
As a result, it's often the case that quite a few of the French horn players in a modern orchestra actually began their musical careers as trumpet players. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 69. Section 3. You will hear two university students, Phil and Stella, talking to their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27 on pages 69 and 70. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Come in. Ah, yes, Stella. Is Phil there too? Mm -hmm. Good. Come on in. OK, so you're here to discuss your research project. Have you decided what to focus on? You were thinking of something about the causes of mood changes, weren't you? Yes, but the last time we saw you, you suggested we narrowed it down to either the effects of weather or urban environment. So we've decided to focus on the effects of weather. Right, that's more manageable. So your goal is, uh, Phil? To prove the hypothesis, no, to investigate the hypothesis that the weather has an effect on a person's mood. Hmm, good. And uh, what's your thesis, Stella? Well, our thesis is that in general, when the weather's good, it has a positive effect on a person's mood, and bad weather has a negative effect. Hmm. Uh, can you define your terms here? For example, what do you mean by good and bad? OK. Well, good would be sunny, warm weather, and bad would be when it's cold and cloudy or raining. And how would you define an effect on a person's mood? What would you be looking to find? An effect on the way a person feels. Mm. Uh, a change in the way they feel, um, like from feeling happy and optimistic to sad and depressed. Right. And what sort of weather variables will you be looking at? Oh, sunshine, temperature, cloudiness, precipitation, among others. It'll depend a bit what the weather's like when we do the survey. Fine. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what about background reading? I gave you some suggestions. Did you manage to read any of it? Yes. We read the Ross Vickers article, the one comparing the groups of American Marines training in summer and winter. Hmm. That's quite relevant to our study. It was interesting because the Marines who were training in the cold winter conditions tried to cheer themselves up by thinking of warm places, but it didn't really work. Yes. They were trying to force themselves to have a positive mental outlook, but in fact it had the opposite effect, and they ended up in a very negative state of mind. Hmm. And we found some more research by someone who wasn't on the reading list you gave us, George Whitebourne. He compared people living in three countries with very different climatic conditions. Actually, he looked at several things, not just the weather. But he found some people's reactions to bad weather were much worse than others, and it was linked to how stressed they were generally. Uh, the weather on its own didn't have such a significant effect on mood. 
And we looked at a paper by Haver. Haverton. Yeah. He broke weather up into about 15 or 16 categories and did qualitative and quantitative research. He found that humans respond to conditions in the weather with immediate responses, such as fear or amazement. But these responses can also be linked to associations from their earlier life, such as a particular happy or sad event. Uh, did you have a look at Stanfield's work? Yes. It was interesting because the type of questions he asked was similar to what we were planning to use in our survey. Yes. He asked people how they were feeling on days with good and bad weather. He found the biggest factor seemed to be the humidity. Moods were most negative on days with a lot of rainfall. Long periods without sunshine had some effect, but nothing like as much. Hmm. That could be quite a useful model for your project. Yes, we thought so too. Although we can't continue our survey for as long as he did, he did his over a six-month period. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30 on page 70. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Right. Well, you've made quite a good start. Uh, so, where are you going from here? Well, we've already made the questionnaire we're going to use for the survey. It's quite short, just eight questions. We're aiming to survey 20 people over a period of three months from October to December. We can't specify the actual dates yet because it depends on the weather. We want to do the survey on days with a range of different weather conditions. And we'll just be working on campus, so our data will only be statistically sound for the student population here. That's OK. Have you thought how you'll determine what will constitute each aspect of weather? And how many you're looking at? We decided on four. The amount of sunshine, cloudiness, temperature and precipitation. We thought we might use the internet to get data on weather conditions on the days we do the survey, but we haven't found the information we need, so we might have to measure it ourselves. We'll see. Then we've got to analyse the results, and we'll do that using a spreadsheet, giving numeric values to answers. And then, of course, we have to present our findings to the class, and we want to make it quite an interactive session. We want to involve the class in some way in the presentation, maybe by trying to create different climatic conditions in the classroom, <laughs> but we're still thinking about it. I see. Well, that sounds as if you're on the right lines. Now, what I'd suggest that you think about, in addition to the work you've done... That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about universities and colleges in Britain. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Every year, thousands of young people want to study in Great Britain. 
They come from a range of backgrounds and have varying expectations of what their study in the country will be like and how to apply to the university. Today, I'd like to talk on universities and colleges in Britain. There are 45 universities, 30 polytechnics, and about 1,000 major technical, commercial, education, and art colleges in the UK. In 1973 to 1974, there were over 251,200 full time students in universities, of whom almost 10% were from overseas. A total of nearly 276,350 students attending full-time courses in establishments of further education and about 130,270 in colleges of education. University first degree courses in arts and sciences are normally of three or four years duration and, with very few exceptions, Students are not admitted for any shorter period of study. The academic year normally extends from October to June and is divided into three terms. Information about courses and entrance requirements should be obtained by writing direct to the university at least 12 months before the proposed date of admission. All applications for admission are dealt with by the University's Central Council on Admissions, the UCA, to which all candidates seeking admission to a full-time internal first degree course or a first diploma course of more than one year's duration must apply. Full details of the admission procedure are to be found in the UCA handbook, How to Apply for Admission to a University. A copy of this handbook and the standard application form should be obtained from the UCA at PO Box 28, Cheltenham and Gloucestershire, GL501HY. The application form must be returned to the UCA by a stated closing date, usually in December, October for Oxford and Cambridge. The UCA will continue to send application forms to universities for consideration at their discretion for a limited period after the 15th of December. But candidates are strongly advised to ensure that their application forms reach the UCA by the stated closing date to help their chances of selection. Candidates who fail to obtain a place in the initial selection period are automatically put into the Clearing House scheme in June-July, when these candidates' application forms are again sent to those universities which still have vacancies. Students from the following countries should send their application forms to the UCA via the Overseas Student Office of their own country in London, Bahamas, Brunei, Cyprus, Ghana, Guyana, India, Luxembourg, Singapore, Tanzania, Thailand and Uganda. Graduates of a university in Britain or overseas who wish to take another first degree course should approach the university concerned to require whether it wishes them to apply direct or through the central UCA scheme. Now, let's turn to transfer. It is very rare for a student who has begun a first degree course at one university in Britain to transfer to another British university with a view to completing it there and there is no provision for the automatic granting of credit for university studies already undertaken. Students who have already completed some university-level study should make inquiries directly with the individual university. To be considered for admission, a candidate must show that his earlier education has qualified him to enter the course and that he speaks, writes and understands English sufficiently well. The usual minimum qualifications for entry to a first degree course in a university are good passes in the General Certificate of Education, the British School Leaving Examination, either three passes at ordinary level and two advanced level, or one at ordinary level and three at advanced level. A certificate which gives admission to a university in the candidate's own country will be taken into consideration for admission to a British university. 
but a university may still require passes in some subjects of the GCE, or an equivalent examination. It should be noted that possession of the minimum entrance requirements does not guarantee admission. Selection is competitive and each application is judged on its merits. The British Council offices overseas and the Schools Council, 160 Great Portland Street, London W1N 6LL, are prepared to offer advice on the acceptability of specific overseas qualifications in place of the British General Certificate of Education. A copy of the original certificate and, where appropriate, an approved translation should accompany all inquiries. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.